Challenger. Welcome back to the world of once again to the Global Circular Economy Forum this morning was stimulating and inspiring. I mean, the morning here in Canada. With you, uh, you Even the evening for you depends on where you are. So this morning we spoke of the uh, interlinking various movements. We're here to speak of the circular economy, but the circular economy is part of the biodiversity crisis, climate change, and other movements. Th the fight for social justice, environmental justice. A lot of speakers have spoke, spoken to us of their uh, interest in the environment and solutions based on nature the importance of having more people at the table. So it was a, a cacophony, if you like, of movements. And it was a pleasure to listen to that. It shows to what point everything is interlinked. You think about if you have the, the right voices at the table, mm. then the justice piece starts to look after itself and the ideas start to flow and the collaborations begin and the actions and the ripples. So um, we were talking earlier with um, the head of ITK from Iqaluit um, in the north and Nain Nobed and just such wisdom mm. in the simplicity of it. And we've got so much more to come for you this afternoon. We're talking about now building value, how circular opportunities for natural resource sectors can be taken seriously and incorporated into people's thinking. We're going to look at how circular economies offer long-term prosperity for all sectors and economies. And we're going to look at how value gets driven right across the economy and into supply chains as well. That's an conversation very important. That's an important discussion in Canada and even Finland. So we have the Minister of the Environment, Krista McConan from Finland. We are going to be welcoming back Citrus Communications Director, Alina Ravante. Okay, Alina, back over to you. Thank you. Hello, Minister Mikkonen, and thank you so much for being with us today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, circular economy aims to reduce the resource intensity of our production and consumption by keeping resources in circulation, designing out waste and regenerating natural systems. So uh, what opportunities does a more circular world present to resource-rich countries like Finland and Canada? Natural resources have greatly, greatly contributed to our economies, but nature also plays an important part in our cultures and identities. While the societies have closed during the COVID pandemic, people have really found a deeper connection with nature and realized better its importance to our well-being. The unsustainable use of natural resources is the main cause of climate change and biodiversity loss. Circular economy provides tools to solve both these crises and help us to ensure that our nature and resources are also accessible in the future. Circular economy provides ways to generate green growth. To facilitate the transition, Finland have, has recently launched a strategic program to promote a circular economy. The goal of the program is to reduce the use of natural resources and to double the productivity of resources and the circular material use by year 2035 from the levels of 2015. These objectives also serve our government's target of climate neutrality by 2030. To incorporate different sectors, we will sign an agreement on a low-carbon circular economy. Key companies and industry associations, among others, may join the agreement and voluntarily commit to implementing the natural resource targets and promoting a carbon-neutral circular economy society. 
our climate and circular economic targets, we want to lead by example. And so, how we can create prosperity while solving the climate and biodiversity crisis. Circular practices such as the sharing economy and services together with resource efficiency help us to meet our needs in planetary boundaries. They also increase the value of our resources. With our expertise in circularity, we can strengthen our position in the international markets. For example, as a forest-covered nation like Canada also, we can prioritize the innovating and exporting of high-value added solutions that help replacing the non-renewable ones in the global market. At the same time, we must ensure that the forest use practices are sustainable and transparent so the customers can rely on the sustainability of our products. We cannot overlook the economic benefits of circular economy. By preserving the value of materials, creating net networks to utilize side streams, and with the efficient use of energy and materials, we can generate billions in turnover and savings. Circular business models, technologies, and solutions will create economic growth and jobs in a more resilient and green way. The argument seems clear from a national perspective, but let's take a moment to look at the other side of the equation. You touched upon, upon uh, individual companies already, but I would like you to elaborate a bit more. Why would individual resource companies adopt circular practices? Uh, businesses can gain the same economic benefits as I mentioned in the national framework. Circular practices generate savings, but also new business opportunities. We see that sustainable business models are becoming a new normal. Many, many benefits of circularity also include better reputation, new investments, and customers and new markets. Naturally, resource efficiency also saves companies money. Building new business models and industrial synergies might mean, for example, that side and waste streams circulate between companies. This can create new win-win situation. When we build new carbon neutral world, we need raw materials. At the same time, companies are starting to ask if using virgin raw materials is sustainable. More and more companies are finding that circular economy provides future answers. So there definitely is, is a positive side and a win-win situation yes. also from the side of the businesses. Thank you very much for your fascinating views, Minister Mikkonen. And now back to you, Catherine and Chuk. Back to us, Catherine. Thank you so much. Okay. So good to hear from the okay. two of you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So good to hear from the two of you and to bring that perspective right into the center of this conversation. Chuk. That was amazing. And it's always so nice hearing a political perspective as we now transition into a business perspective. So really sort of making sure that we are hitting on that whole note of um, intersectionality, interconnectedness between movements and between ways of uh, creating solutions. So bringing in a business perspective, we have two CEOs. Um, Correo CEO Ashley Morris will interview Mark Kutifani, CEO of Anglo-American. So over to you, Ashley. Thanks so much. I'm very excited to be here with you today to explore the opportunities that circularity brings to the natural resources sector and to ask some fundamental questions of a world leader in mining. Now, the world population cannot survive without mining, but nor can it survive with a mining industry, which is extractive, transactive and linear by design. What's needed is a clear move away from being metals and mining suppliers to materials solution providers, from resource extractors to resource developers. We have made progress, but our progress is slow. We must recalibrate our thinking and catalyze innovation and collaboration throughout the sector. It's essential we see circular initiatives moving from downstream initiatives like recycling through to material design innovations. We're seeing everything from nano laminated materials that are outperforming conventional metals to the capture of value from tailings and slags. 
and new strategic partnerships by the likes of Tesla and BHP that are getting behind a shared commitment to a low carbon future. The opportunities are infinite and the opportunities of the circular economy far outweigh the challenges. There is a convergence of trends that is accelerating the mining industry's adoption of the circular economy. Our planet needs it, but consumers, investors, regulators, and supply chain partners, they're crying out for it. Now, as we take a future focus, the circulation of finite resources is ripe for innovation. A de-emphasis on selling the commodity to circulating the product, performance, or knowledge as a service will de-risk the mining operations of the future. What we need are strong leaders, strong leaders that are going to shift our mindsets from asking why the circular economy to why not. We are privileged today from here to hear from one such leader. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Kudafani, the CEO of Anglo-American. Welcome, Mark. It's fantastic to have you as part of the World Circular Economy Forum again. Thank you, Ashley. Great to be here. Now, Mark, I wanted to kick off the session for those who are not familiar with Anglo-American, for you to just unpack what Anglo-American does. Well, um, I, normally, or three or four years ago, I would describe us as a mining company. Today, though, I'd like to think more, more than about what we do, but what we produce. So we talk about being a metals and minerals company, uh, and we provide those products that literally make the world work. Uh, and we are, we hope, becoming a materials solutions company, which is about the future. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing those insights. Now, I'm really interested because I'm a very practical woman to dive into the first question, which is drawing it down to practicalities. When we talk about circular mining, Mark, what might that look like at the site level? Could you take us through an example? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a big word and it covers lots of issues. And for us, the key word that goes with it is waste. And in our world, it's about eliminating waste. So producing the products that the world needs to make it work, uh, we use energy, we use water, we physically have a, a, a physical footprint that is a, a, as measured by the land we use. It's about minimising all of those inputs to produce products that are used. It also includes reducing uh, the time, uh, the inputs from people, the use of the products that are used to deliver our products, reducing that. It's literally getting rid of or using as little as we can. Ultimately, it's about producing products where we produce no waste. Everything is reused. And we, in terms of an environmental footprint, shrink our footprint to zero. If anything, we want to make it a positive environmental footprint. And so it's the whole concept of uh, uh, pro producing goods for society with literally a positive footprint at the same time. That's brilliant. It's really talking about that systems-based approach, thinking everything through end to end and very much in line with the principle of circularity to regenerate the natural system, to have that positive impact. Now, I know from our previous World Circular Economy Forum chat on mining for circularity, that Anglo is on this transition towards the circular economy. Could you lay out what it's going to look like over the next five years for the organisation as you scale up that transition? So uh, there are really at least two uh, streams of work. Um, the first step or the first stream is actually setting the principles through which we operate. So it's understanding how do we minimise inputs into producing our products and then beyond that, how do we then use the waste that we create and create new value with new products. So if we create acid, how do we turn that into water that can be reused in a community? Or if we're producing waste, how might we use that in road base or some construction material that someone else can use that then has a positive 
impact. It looks at every part of the process and it's about educating people in terms of how we can have a positive impact uh, in terms of the way we operate. The, the second part then is how do we become part of a community in creating uh, new opportunities for those communities? And we talk about our sustainable mining plan. It's about how we then become part of the community and co opportunities from a mine. So a mine is simply not about a hole in the ground. It's about all the things we produce. But given that we put all this infrastructure in place, how can we use that infrastructure then to support the community, create more jobs, more opportunities, using products that we used to call waste in things that they may uh, be doing in the community, construction, whatever it may be, and create a, a total system. And then ultimately, it's about then uh, understanding how we can be part of the, the recycling of our products, let's say PGMs, for example, uh, put them through our processes and put them back into market so that we ultimately really do become a material solutions provider in every sense of the word. So it's not simply about mining. It's not simply about producing metals and minerals. It's about producing products that people use for a whole range of things and being a catalyst for their use in an um, environmentally sustainable way. I really like that those strategic linkages and the mind shift that's required to now look at materials, not those that were classed as waste, but actually as those resources that can have contribution and benefit into the communities in which you operate, into new supply chains, as well as thinking about how can you close the loop on materials that you have introduced into the global market. I really love some of those key points you've pulled out there. Now, the World Circuit Economy Forum this year, its, its theme is game changes. And I'm keen to hear from you what you see those game changes to be in the mining and metals industry and beyond. Uh, look, I think there are so many different game changes. Clearly, um, the, the, the pursuit of carbon neutrality, establishing renewable energy sources, then producing hydrogen, putting hydrogen in trucks that gets rid of uh, uh, the use of diesel, it's creating these new grid, energy grids, new approaches, new technologies in changing the way we mine, being more precise about what we do and changing the underlying processes. And the third element is provenance. It's about uh, being part of a, a broader value stream from literally products that we produce from the earth all the way through to end products, making sure that uh, human rights uh, are protected or are certainly enhanced. Uh, it's about making sure that people are paid a fair wage. It's about all of the things that we do as mining companies in understanding how we uh, track products through the value chain. So blockchain, those technologies helping us understand those products and how they're tracked through to customers. And then ultimately, how they go from customers back through to people like ourselves who reprocess materials and help it find new homes in terms of a, a circular approach. Those technologies we think are all game changers and things that we're looking at in terms of creating a very different business model for the long term. I would agree with you. I think the transformation in the indus energy industry, the track and tracing of our materials and products through global economies is unlocking so much opportunity that we hadn't seen previously. So thank you for those insights. Now, drawing into our final question, I really want to take it more to a personal level. I'd really like to connect with the industry leaders on what was the personal motivator for them, that key ingredient that catalyzed you to, to lead this company towards circularity? So, look, as a point of principle, I've got seven kids. So I'd like them to inherit a planet that is better for me having been here. Uh, so that's the first point. So it is personal. It's, it's about the contribution yeah. you make to society. Secondly, uh, as a company, uh, reducing energy consumption, reducing water consumption, reducing the land that you use, which means you're increasing production intensity, which means you're using your capital more effectively, means you're creating value for shareholders and all of our stakeholders in society. So that ultimately, the footprint that we can create can be a positive footprint and can make for a sustainable world. And, and for me, at the end of the day, it comes back to the kids. Uh, but at the same time, it's consistent with returns to shareholders, 
returns to local communities because you're not making the mess that they have always associated with mining. So there are winners all the way through. And that's for me is the game changing approach that I think uh, is within our grasp and certainly one we're pursuing as an Anglo-American. Thank you for sharing that. Family is so important, as is that contribution and value. And, you know, as we both know, the circular economy is about value and value creation and really focusing on what that means for us as individuals, our families and our communities. That has drawn us to the end of our session, Mark. I really want to thank you for your time, your contribution and absolutely your leadership in driving Anglo-American towards circularity and the influence that has into our global supply chains. So thanks, thanks again. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thanks for the opportunity. Next up is a panel on forestry and the forest-based bioeconomy, moderated by Virginie Chambost of Envertis. I will be back afterwards to wrap up a conversation with some leading minds in the circular resource sector. Over to you, Virginie. Thank you very much, Ashley. This is a great pleasure to be here with you today. Welcome to everyone. So now we turn to the forestry and the bioeconomy sector with three panelists representing companies from across the value chain. A value chain that starts with forest is quite different from one that starts in a mine. Forest products are not endlessly reusable, uh, but they are renewable. So the forestry industry is already part in what we can call, I think, a, a certain circular economy. Uh, reducing and managing its waste and often trying to give a second life to recycled fibers while producing an array of products supporting the long-term value of the forest raw materials. The case of Stora Enzo is one example among many others around the globe. However, however, this doesn't prevent the industry to question how can we increase circularity in the traditional forestry industry. And I may say that over the past 10 to 15 years, efforts have been made across the globe within the forestry industry in order to create more value out of the beautiful raw material we have, wood, while tapping into new and untraditional markets through the use of cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin to displace fossil-based products and now create circular value chains. However, the role of the industry in the circular value economy has yet to be concretized. If you can go to the next slide, please. And achieving this goal is neither simple nor obvious. Among technical, financial, market, business risk, and you can name them, moving from traditional commodity-oriented business model to added value product portfolios, there are several barriers that forestry companies need to overcome in order to establish circular bioeconomy value chain. And one of which, if I just can name one today, is related about tying in with untraditional partners in order to identify win-win and sustainable business models that will lead to value creation across the value chains toward the bioeconomy circular value chain. A business and innovation ecosystem would be essential for success in this regard to address the barriers and accelerate implementation in a very competitive context. So to help us understand this subject today and how circularity can lead to regenerative uh, resource use, I would like to invite the panelists to give a brief presentation and discussion. Let's start at the beginning with a company that owns and manages forests. Nicolas Gordon is the Sustainable Director of CMPC and is joining us from Chile. Hi, Nicolas. Hi, Virginie. Um, Thank you, and, and thanks to the organizers of the World Circular Economy Forum. It's uh, really a pleasure for us to be part of this session and uh, this fantastic lineup of, of speakers. Um, CMPC is a Chilean-based company in the forest, pulp, and paper sector uh, with more than 102 years of existence. We have industrial operations in eight countries in Latin America, and we are one of the largest market pulp producers in the world and second largest tissue producer in Latin America. Our forest assets total more than 1.2 million hectares uh, divided in Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, of which 30% roughly is set aside for conservation and protection purposes. Over 90% of our forests are certified under sustainable forest management and chain of custody um, certifications. And uh, we should be reaching by the end of 2021 this year, 99% uh, of, of certified 
forests, which is a, a great, great achievement for us. Uh, circular business models are a key, key piece of our sustainability strategy, which is why in 2019 we established the goal of achieving zero waste landfills by 2025. Along with reducing our absolute direct and indirect GG emissions by 50% by 2030, reducing our water intensity by 25% by 2025, and adding another 100,000 hectares for conservation and protection purposes. As a forest sector, um, you know, as, as an entire industry, we believe we must invest in innovation and the general adoption of fiber-based products as carbon-rich and circular alternatives to many, um, to, to many of the current offerings. We must also work to drive more science and research to better understand the carbon-related impacts of forests and wood-based products in order to build a clear narrative that better informs consumers and raises awareness of the benefits of the circular economy. You know, we are um, facing increasingly scarcer resource scenarios of fiber, water, soil, and circular practices really present a strong contribution towards operational efficiency in, in, in companies like ours. Um, the reasons why I think uh, companies are, are, are really adopting circular practices is because we see a, a global climate, biodiversity and ecosystem loss in, in water crises that are, that are really stressing, you know, the ability for society and, and business to, to um, achieve their, their goals and, and, um, and provide the services and products that their, their, um, their existence um, really is what, what they're about. And, um, but there's also business opportunities as, con as consumers are really changing their purchasing decisions and, and adjusting their needs and, and their understanding to these, these uh, global trends and crises. Um, we are closely following regulatory and market, physical, technology and reputational risks and opportunities related to climate, related to ecosystems and resources to ensure that they are counted in our company's strategy in the mid, mid, mid to long term. In increasing investor understanding, expectations are also another driver in the private sector to really having these, uh, these practices in place. In terms of what we plan for the next few years, in 2020, we established CMPC Ventures, which is a dedicated department within our innovation division with the aim to accelerate a sustainable future through corporate venture capital. By partnering with the best startups and global solutions, we have a connection to our purpose, which is to contribute to general well-being and a sustainable within a more sustainable and, and renewable, you know, solutions. We see enormous potential in our forests and uh, a source of future. So I'll leave it at there. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, up next, we have a company that uses the waste from one industry uh, to reduce the waste in another. Laurence Boudreau, uh, General Manager at Bosque Bioproducts, is joining us from Quebec City, Canada. Welcome, Laurence. Thank you so much, Virginie, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to present Bosque Bioproducts, uh, who provide a sustainable alternative to plastics. So I'll start by telling you the story behind Bosque uh, because it all started more than 10 years ago when our founder, Paul Boudreau, created a unique partnership. Uh, when he had the brilliant idea to put together a fermentation technology and the, a waste from the forest sector. So Paul thought that he could solve two problems at the time if we could find a way to produce PHA, which is a highly compostable biopolymer, um, using pulp and paper sludges. And obviously we would have a significant environmental impact if we could use the waste from the forest sector to reduce plastic waste. So we did a lot of R&D works and uh, it worked. So we began to uh, sell our PHA into the linear plastic value chain. And companies at that time offered to mix this highly compostable biopolymer with conventional plastics. 
So <laughs> this led us to think um, how we could uh, create a new material that would be made out of our PHA that would be ready to use by any plastic product manufacturers and that would be just as convenient as plastic but would be 100% bio-based, compostable and that would, do, what, that would not contain any toxic chemical additive. So it's when Region was created. Alors, nous avons créé donc notre entreprise et nous avons fait beaucoup de chemin. Nous avons euh, une première euh, usine de régénération euh, ouverte au Québec et ça nous a euh, donné la possibilité d'offrir notre produit euh, au secteur des plastiques. C'est un matériel compostable à base bio euh, disponible à n'importe quel producteur de plastique. Alors, ils peuvent utiliser Regen euh, pour faire n'importe quel article, euh, emballage flexible, rigide, euh, L'ustensile de cuisine, il y a tellement de choses que nous pouvons faire avec Region. Et les producteurs doivent simplement euh, changer des plastiques qu'ils utilisent maintenant et ils peuvent les remplacer avec Region. Et tout se fait de la même façon, les, avec les mêmes équipements. Et les produits, c'est les mêmes. Mais la différence, c'est que le produit euh, euh, final est 100% euh, euh, bioforestier et ou source bio et compostable. Alors, ce projet euh, Bosque va contribuer à un secteur forestier plus compétitif et, et résilient en utilisant euh, les déchets euh, pour des produits euh, composables. Of sustainability and circular economy. So clearly, Bosque is a concrete example that there are solutions that allows companies to benefit from circular economy to create value. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for this nice introduction about Basque. I can't wait to have this panel <laughs> kicking off after the presentation of uh, Maya Payakolio from Meta Group, a company based in Finland that operates across the value chain uh, for wood, producing everything from pulp and also towards added value. Uh, Maya Payakolio is the vice president of climate and circular economy at Meta Group, and she's joining us from Finland. Hello, Maya. Hello, everybody. And can I have the slides, please? Thank you so much. So hello uh, from Metsa Group and, and greetings from Finland. Like uh, more than 70% of the Finnish uh, countryside is, is covered with forests. And wood from these uh, sustainably managed forests is in the center of Metsa Group's business. Um, we focus on five business areas. And what makes us a bit special company, unique one, is that our parent company, Metsalito Cooperative, is owned by 100,000 Finnish forest owners. And what this means is that uh, there is a constant dialogue, collaboration between forest owners and the rest of the value chain. What it also means is that Meta Group is dedicated to long-term thinking and long-term development to increase uh, the value of forests by, by adding value to the wood that is uh, used and also by, by safeguarding biodiversity and, and regenerative growth of forests. It is of interest to note that in Finland, in Finnish forests, actually the amount of wood increases every year. So more wood is grown than is used. Altogether, around uh, 9,000 uh, people work at Metsa Group, and we have production in eight different countries. And, and the five business areas we, we focus on, they, they cover all the value chain uh, of, of forestry, like starting from, uh, from forest management services and wood supply, and uh, then we also uh, have a business areas uh, concentrate on, on pulp and, and saw timber, um, uh, tissue paper, grease proof paper, and, and wood products like, like blue roof. Um, we constantly want to uh, increase our collaboration uh, with, with external partners. 
And within uh, Metsa Group uh, company, we also have an innovation company called Metsa Spring, which, for example, invests in startups that, that have um, interesting innovations that are connected to Metsa Group's value chains. And, and constantly we are really looking for, for new, new partners. We also have created novel uh, models uh, to, to collaborate with our customers. For example, Metsa Board, uh, who produces paperboard, um, uh, have just established um, a packaging excellence center in the center of Finland. And, and the idea of the Packaging Excellence Center is that uh, customers can collaborate with, with our designers and R&D people and, and then really like together uh, design sustainable circular packaging solutions. Uh, Metsa Fiber has created a unique uh, bioproduct meal concept. The core of, of the bioproduct meal concept is, is the production of pulp. But it's all based on ecosystem thinking. So uh, in, in addition to pulp, uh, the, the bioproduct mill also produces other bioproducts. Uh, I could name some like, um, uh, for example, there's a very nice um, example of circular chemistry. Like um, in, in this concept, uh, the sulfur dioxide emissions are actually captured and then they are utilized in making sulfuric acid. And then the sulfuric acid is used in another part of the process. Uh, another very nice example of collaboration and, and um, increasing the amount of bioproducts that can be produced, integrated in pulp production, is that Metsa Fiber has collaborated with Veolia and, and they have been investigating the possibility of production of biomethanol in, in connection with, uh, with pulp production. So there are really huge, huge possibilities. And, and the bioproduct meal concept uh, actually um, offers kind of a, a platform for, for innovations and for novel kind of, of collaboration. The first meal of this kind uh, was uh, started to operate in 2000, 2017 in Anekoski. And actually just yesterday, uh, the, the foundation stone was um, founded or laid in Kemi for another bioproduct uh, meal, which is based on this kind of ecosystem thinking. And uh, just uh, then to show you a few uh, examples of nice innovations, um, to Metsa Spring has actually together with the Japanese company Itochu, they have a demo plant in, in the Anekoski uh, ecosystem, uh, which has um, I started to produce on pilot scale um, this textile fiber that uses uh, pulp as, as raw material. And then uh, on the slide, you can see another innovation. Uh, Woodia is a small startup, and Mr. Spring has invested in Woodia. And, and Woodia, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, has, has designed and developed uh, nice materials for bathroom and kitchen furniture. And also these materials, they are biocomposites and they utilize a uh, side stream from, from Metsa Group. And, and really, as I said, we are constantly looking for, for new, new partners to, to collaborate with. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you very much, Laurence and Nicolas. I would like to open now uh, the discussion uh, through several questions to you. I will first uh, ask Maya and Nicolas to get back on me on one specific element. So how do you think the development of bioproducts will strengthen circularity in the forest industry and other sectors? And what role our industry might play in the bioeconomy? So maybe Maya, would you like to open the discussion? Uh, yes, uh, if we think of, of wood as a raw material, when it comes from sustainably managed forest, is it, it is actually circular by design. And I think one very key aspect in, in um, circular economy is that we, we try to phase out virgin fossil carbon and instead use renewable carbon. Uh, 
So that's a good starting point. But then, uh, in addition to this, I just uh, told this example of, of Metza board. So, uh, so Metza board, uh, they, they produce a paper board, and it's not only made from renewable uh, resources, it's also optimized so that it's very light. So in that sense, it's also like a, it's also circular. You can recycle it, but it's very light. So in that sense, you also reduce waste from from the beginning. And then when you combine this in in this um, um, uh, smart design, that really takes into account the whole value chain of the packaging solution. So by combining all these um, uh, aspects of circularity, uh, I think it uh, it's very interesting to collaborate with customers and together in collaboration with the value chain to really have sustainable solutions on, on the market. What is your take? Thank you very much, Maya. What is your take on this, uh, Nicolas? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, we, we, we need to understand that the circular buy economy can be a huge business opportunity. Um, that, that's, I think, why at CMPC we're members of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the sector initiative within, which is the Four Solutions Group. We have been working on a series on, of reports that describe the sector's role and potential in the circular buy economy, as well as aligning all these efforts with the SDGs. Um, as a group of leading companies who intend to spearhead the transformation towards a more sustainable world, we've established a set of KPIs to demonstrate progress towards these common goals. Some of these KPIs look at, for example, the R&D investment in the buy economy, uh, the communications of the benefits to all audiences that we engage with, the partnerships with academia and research centers uh, to to drive uh, further, further knowledge. In terms of circularity, we look at recycling rates, reuse material inputs, and products that incorporate circular design principles, et cetera. At CMPC as a semi-integrated forest, timber, pulp, board, paper, and tissue company, we have an immense opportunity uh, within, as with uh, all our value chain and other sectors, for example, the agriculture, the building sector, um, to drive transformation. Uh, a few examples in our case are molded pulp products that we've been developing using byproducts um, as uh, fiber streams from other paper making processes uh, from our mills and plants. Um, in Brazil, in our Guaiba mill, we partnered with a company called Bida, where we actually reuse 99% of byproducts and waste streams of the mill that are being used in, in specifically the agriculture sector in, in southern Brazil. Uh, yet I think that we still must strengthen uh, the development uh, from, of, of new bioproducts from, from design. Uh, we've focused a lot on, on, on waste reuse, but I think there's still a huge challenge and opportunity for, for new products. You know, we're interested in looking into um, sustainable construction, new biomaterials and biochemicals, newer, more circular and digital business models, sustainable and, intelli and intelligent packaging, among others. I think um, innovative bioproducts will position the forest sector as a key player in many sectors where today it's not present, uh, and therefore meeting people's needs for sustainable solutions and, and lessening pressures on the planet. Thank you very much, Nicolas. I think it's an amazing segue to Laurence. <laughs> Laurence coming from another spot within the value chain, uh, getting some of the ways which are byproduct, I would say, rather than waste within the forest industry and turning that into added value products and then tying in down the value chain. So tell me more about what you think are the main barriers to evolve from what we call linear value chain into circular value chain. What are you take on that? Well, I think the main challenge is the fact that there is so much players in the value chain and it's not easy to convince everyone in the chain to uh, take a step towards circularity. It's always a question about who will take the first step and who will follow. Uh, but I think that like we did, when you work with every level of the chain, including the consumers, and when you have a good team, when you have a, a bioproduct that is in line with its market, we can succeed in transforming a value chain, but it takes a lot of work. And also maybe I can add that I think 
a lot of people think about creating new circular economy, new value chain. But I think that before we create a different uh, uh, value chain that would be in parallel, we have to think about what are the synergies that we can create by putting together two linear uh, value chain, like we did at BOSC. We put together the forest sector, uh, more specifically the paper sector, and we put it with the plastic market, which never worked together. And then we create a new uh, circular economy and we close the loop. So I think it's uh, there's a lot of opportunity still to uh, to work with. and. Um, so another excellent segue to the last question I would like to ask the panel. We have a short time though to answer this one, but it's about what are the changes required to accelerate and scale up uh, the circular transition that your companies are uh, involved in. So maybe each of you, uh, one short answer on this about what could be the main changes to support that? Should it be legislative, behavioral, market changes? So maybe I can start on this one. Um, I would say the short answer is regulations and a switch in the conceptions in the consumer behaviors and in the markets. Uh, we're seeing more and more regulations being put in place around the world to uh, reduce, as an example, to reduce plastic waste. Uh, let's just give uh, the example of the ban on the uh, single use plastic items. And if regulations encourage the use of bio-based and compostable alternatives, or if the plastic market switch its conception of petrochemical plastic for alternatives such as Regen, uh, it will definitely be a catalyst to bring the transition for the forest sector and the plastic sector towards circularity. Thank you, Maya or Nicolas, any take for the forestry sector? Uh, I can I can continue. Um, one thing I, I'm really looking forward to is, is new metrics to measure li really circularity on on systemic level. I think nowadays uh, we have uh, like tools to measure quite dot wise development, like we are measuring recycling rates, uh, the, the the use of secondary raw materials. Um, I know that there are some um, development ongoing related to circular metrics. I'm really looking forward for that. It, it would really guide the development on, on sustainability and circularity on, on systemic level. And then uh, re regarding uh, regulation, um, as I said, we, we have like invested in new bioproduct mills and, 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 and other um, facilities as well. So for us, it's also very important that the regulative um, environment is, is kind of stable and predictable because obviously the investment and innovation cycles in, in, in business and industry as ours, they are long. So those Thank two you. things. Thank you very much, Niklas. Maybe a very short, 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 short input. Yeah, I think new regulations will definitely increase the opportunities for forest-based uh, solutions. I think uh, public-private par partnerships are, are key, and uh, they, they will uh, they will help companies to really sort of address new regulations. In in the Euro in, you know European U Union, we see a lot of regulations that apply to imports in upstream value chains. So really, the entire world is is subject to to uh, stricter regulations. We need to, as a sector, I think, help people to understand the consequences of their choices, and more information can definitely be available through technology. Um, I also think that bio and circular cannot be a synonym of more costly or expensive products and solutions. We need to, as companies, we need to make sure that we can make them affordable and, and, and uh, attainable to all. And lastly, I would say that as companies, we need to work in, in collaboration, scale up solutions to drive industrial symbiosis. And I think the finance sector also must provide, uh, you know, incentives for the circular buy economy and, and really drive market forces in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the three of you. I would have loved to stay longer, but I think that we need to give the mic back to Ashley. So thank you very much for joining today, giving and sharing your perspective. Wish you a great day and back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Virginie. So we've heard from business leaders in mining and the bioeconomy, but what about the sector as a whole? Joining me for a conversation on what it will take to catalyze the legislative, 
behavioural and market changes that were just identified by business leaders. Uh, Dr. Vanessa Ushier, Manager of the Policy Analysis Division in the African Development Bank Group's Natural Resources Centre, and Dr. Jeff McCartney, the Senior Director of Research for the Smart Prosperity Institute in Canada. Now, we've only got a few minutes and there's a whole lot to unpack from what we've just heard. But Jeff, why don't you start us off? How can circularity help address risk and amplify opportunities in the natural resources sector? I'd love to hear an example if we could, Jeff. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is an interesting question to start off with in a really interesting discussion in, in this session so far. Um, before I get to an example, though, I thought it might be helpful to take a moment just to clarify a bit the risks and opportunities we're really talking about here. Uh, we've heard a lot of examples throughout this session today about innovative business solutions to advancing circularity in the resource sectors and also the drivers behind that, which are really important. But it means something different for a resource company to explore circular solutions versus understanding more broadly what a global circular economy would mean for resource producing economies, such as Canada, Australia, Finland, Chile, who we've heard from today, or any of the more than 80 countries globally which rely on resource extraction as an economic driver, many of whom are emerging or developing, developing economies in the global south. If we take a step back and look at prominent models or examples of the circular economy, we can see that many of these actually fo you know, they focus on increasing the efficiency of resource use and flowing materials through the economy multiple times. And this is to be expected, but what we also see is that they generally leave primary resource extraction on the periphery of the model as flows simply to be minimized. And at first blush, if you're, you know, if you're located in a resource producing economy or, or one of those sectors, this can be concerning. Um, and it raises different but important questions for both mining and the bioeconomy sector, as well as other uh, primary resource producers. And this is something we've been diving into here at the Smart Prosperity Institute, working with our partners to try to understand the broader risks and implications as a resource producing economy in general. And now what we're finding is that it turns out that the initial impression from these models can be a bit misleading. While we absolutely want to drive improvements in resource efficiency as a fundamental part of the circular economy, there are a number of reports, um, and more all the time, that are hot from prominent international organizations, including the OECD, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank, and many others, that highlight the circular economy transition is taking place against a backdrop of significant growth in material demand globally. And we've summarized a number of these in a recent report that we issued, but just to take one example, a report from the OECD highlights that material demand to about 2060 is projected to double uh, from about 2017 levels. And this is driven by population growth and growing numbers of middle-class consumers in emerging economies. On top of that, if we take seriously the increasing recognition of the material requirements for a low carbon economy, reports from the World Bank suggest we're gonna need increases of 400 to 500% in battery metals, 100 to 300% in material requirements for wind and solar and other forms of storage, and significant growth in major metals like aluminum, copper, and iron ore for steel. And even assuming 100% recycling rates, we're still going to need to see growth in both primary and secondary material production to meet these requirements. So what does this mean for opportunities? It means that for companies and also countries that can improve circularity along their value chains, there's opportunity for, both in growth, for, opportunity for growth in both primary and secondary material production. So just as one example, the numbers I gave you uh, from the OECD report are mainly driven by increasing infrastructure requirements in emerging economies. And what they highlight is growth in demand across a range of materials, including 97% uh, in non-metallic minerals, 127, 126% in metals, 73% in biomass. So there's opportunities here for innovative bioeconomy solutions like mass timber to come in and meet some of the construction material requirements. At the same time, there's space for innovative companies in the mining metals value chain who can show that they're uh, operating with circular economy principles at the mine site and can trace and track those materials along the supply chain to meet these uh, material requirements in a sustainable way. And what we want to see is policies and practices coming in that can help support those producers and make them more competitive uh, in this, you know, to meet these material requirements. Thanks so much, Jeff. I think that was so critical for people to hear some of those statistics about the demand and pull through for these key metals and minerals. But Vanessa, I'm keen to get your perspective on that, uh, obviously coming to this conversation, talking from an emerging economies perspective and linking into some of what Jeff just shared. Yeah, 
you so much, Ashley, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and the African Development Bank to this conversation. So as Jeff has said, there are opportunities to adopt circularities in natural resource extraction. Um, what we're looking at is how this can be applied specifically to water resources management, because we know resource extraction is so water intensive and we're seeing rising water stress and water scarcity in, in Africa and Asia and across the world. So the question is, how can companies, how can governments and investors recognize the risk related to water and integrate this in their planning of investments? So what we've done, for instance, as a very practical example in the AFDB, working with our partners, WWF, we created a program on nature-based solutions for water use in the extractive industries. And we've done some research looking at mining sites and oil and gas sites in Africa to see, for instance, how could water be managed more effectively, uh, looking at water treatment, how wastewater is handled, and even going as far as looking at fresh water sources and how companies can use innovative measures such as payments for ecosystem services, working with local communities to manage these resources more effectively. So I think there are opportunities to really change our mindsets uh, if we talk about biodiversity loss on the global scale, and there are practical steps we can really take to ensure that we're managing these resources for the common good, working with communities, and also bringing this into the investment space. So how are investments aligned with this emerging concept of nature-related risk, and how circularities can help address this risk? Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. I really like that. From water to the mind shift to policy. If we could stay with you, Vanessa, I'd love to unpack the next question, which is all about policymakers and what you believe that one concrete step is that they can take to unlock those nature-based solutions to advance the circular economy. Thank you, Ashley. So the one obvious step is to invest in natural capital accounting and assessment methods. Uh, we've heard all through this event that nature is in crisis. We need to think differently of how nature supports businesses, economies, societies. And so a very practical way is that for decision makers, they invest in how we can actually measure the stock and flow of natural capital and the ecosystem services emerging from this natural capital. So in Africa, for instance, we have seen a growth in programs on natural capital accounting adopted by national statistical bodies and national planning agencies, even to the extent of infrastructure design, investments which are supporting uh, a very intensive use of natural resources and assets. So the opportunities that are really emerging to see how we can change our thinking of how nature is supporting economic activity. We heard from Professor Das Gupta earlier today that really this, it's imperative for us to change our approach. So that obvious thing is to use natural capital accounting and assessments to so inform my investments, our policies, our decisions on how nature is really supporting economic transformation. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more on that particular policy point and the practical action. Jeff, your perspective on this one, what is that policy action that you see that governments can make? Yes, thank you. And, and building from what Vanessa said, I couldn't agree more. We need to be able to track and measure the broader impacts of activities in the resource sectors. And that requires um, things like natural capital accounting, requires appropriate pricing for waste streams and emissions and other uh, uh, impacts of uh, resource extraction and use. Um, and it also requires taking a broader perspective along the entire supply chain. Uh, we're going to explore this more in a session tomorrow on circularity across the metals and minerals value chain, looking from producers uh, in different regions and along different commodity chains globally. Um, but uh, just as an example, um, there's increasing numbers of targets and roadmaps and frameworks being uh, developed by countries, particularly in the global north, looking at uh, circularity requirements. Um, but if you follow these along value chains, a lot of the resource producers who produce the materials that are related to these targets are in the global south and emerging economies. And there's going to be impacts on livelihoods and communities in those uh, regions. And we need to think more broadly, I think, about what the targets and indicators we're developing as part of a global circular solution mean for local producers and workers in these 
regions. Um, there's a recent report from the African Circular Economy Alliance that really highlights uh, this looking and framing that applying circular economy solutions in, the, in metal, and, metal and mineral supply chains require increasing formalization in the sector. Uh, and then they highlight that there's 42 million people globally in the artisanal and small scale mining sector. 32% uh, of these in Africa, 38% in Southeast Asia, about half of these, 40, 50% are women. Um, and 80% of the artisanal small scale mining sector is informal. And we don't have a good track record of integrating them into more formal economies so that we can appropriately track and trace the metals and minerals that are produced. So the implications for these livelihoods are going to be important. And we need to extend that as well to the implication for livelihoods in Canada and Australia and for our Indigenous communities as well, and make sure that their views are appropriately integrated into these visions. And one other uh, point I'll raise is relevant is we need to think uh, in a lot of the conversations that we're involved here, the focus of policy frameworks and measurement for circular economy in the resource sectors tends to be focused on domestic extraction. So we talk to uh, companies and in Canada, we focus on Canadian domestic extraction mining that occurs here. But our, our mining companies have mining assets here and also globally. And we need to think a little bit more about how we can provide policies and incentives uh, and adopt new regulatory frameworks that can help encourage uh, circular solutions right across the international supply chains that we operate through and not just in our own domestic context. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I think that was really important, that last point, to think beyond, you know, our current borders and boundaries, because the circular economy doesn't necessarily stay within those. Materials flow throughout our global supply chains and systems, and I really like all of the statistics that you've brought to the dialogue today, both Vanessa and Jeff, and I think it's really empowered our audience to understand the value of a circular economy more broadly and some of the key risks and opportunities that we need to consider as we move this transition forward. So thank you so much to both of you for joining this session. Now back to you in the studio in Toronto. Thank you so much, Ashley and Jeff and Vanessa. We really appreciate your insights this afternoon. Great to hear from all of you. We have had lots of exciting conversations and we still have more planned for today. Stay with me, guys. Stay, um, comme on dit en français, restez à la fuite parce que vraiment, ça va s'éclater. Keep listening because really the next session is going to be great as well. Really awesome is on rural and remote communities exploring the roads less traveled to circular solutions. And to learn more about circular opportunities in the natural resources sector, you should definitely tune in to our accelerator sessions and those take place tomorrow. Donc, à tantôt tout le monde. So, don't go away. We'll be right back.